when it was first suggested to me that I might write a book about Doctor Who, and I was thinking, well, what, what can you possibly do? Because it's such a saturated marketplace. I mean, you know, every conceivable subject has been covered, really. But then I thought, well, if I am going to write a book about Doctor Who, it should be about an era that I know something about. And obviously I was quite heavily involved in it in the 80s. And the big figure, the key figure in Doctor Who in the 80s was John Nathan Turner. And as soon as I thought about John, I thought, well, he was a really interesting guy who really divided opinion. Um, in many ways, I had already the sense that perhaps he was a bit of a one-man Greek tragedy, in that he was someone who was so full of promise and ambition, um, and he clearly carried that all the way through his time on Doctor Who, but of course it did go quite badly wrong. And so I thought, well, that was interesting. I didn't know much about him before Doctor Who, and I didn't know much about him after Doctor Who, and so I thought, well, let's find out, let's start the research and, and see where it takes me. And I soon discovered that it was a very, very uh, interesting story. I think there were massive gaps in the story of Doctor Who that relate to this incredibly powerful figure who ran it for so long and made so many key decisions and also was a pioneer of certain things that are still echoed in the way the show is made now. And I felt that I had to do him justice. It wasn't just about kind of calling him to account and saying, well, why did he think like this? Why did he behave like that? It was also about giving him credit for some of the amazing things he did. And that's the thing no one will ever go on about. They'll go on about the things that make them feel uncomfortable, but they won't recognise as well, or maybe they will, let's hope they will, that there was also a kind of very positive side to this man and that he did do some amazing things and not just the out there things. I found plenty of evidence of small, minor human acts of kindness, generosity, whatever you want to call it, that really redefined him slightly for me. And, and, I, and so it wasn't just a kind of poignant experience, it was also a kind of positive experience in places which was good. I think the fact that I was the age I was. You know, I kind of came into Doctor Who in the early 80s very starry-eyed. I mean, I really... It was John's early period on the programme that brought me back into it and sort of turned me into a fan, I guess. So then to have the opportunity that I had at that time, which was fantastic. I mean, really a fantastic chance to kind of go and see the show being made, to meet and interview all these people, you know, a lot of whom aren't around anymore, um, to be a, a bystander at that period was a fantastic, I suppose, qualification. Um, but also I aged very quickly with Doctor Who in the sense that the point at which I became involved, everything was just going so great for it. You know, it was the 20th anniversary and, you know, really was kind of in the forefront of people's minds. No one would have predicted that within a couple of years everything would start to go so badly wrong. Um, and I did become quite disillusioned on lots of levels. Um, but I was removed, enough removed from it that it wasn't really a personal thing. I had so many other things going on. I was at university and then starting my own career in telly. So in a way, Doctor Who was always a bonus to me. It wasn't the be-all and end-all. It was an, an additional thing in my life that for a while was really, really good. Um, and then when it ceased to be as good, um, I was able to kind of walk away from it. Um, but when I came back to think about it, I thought, well, yeah, you know, this is in lots of levels, you know, because I've not really thought about it in, in detail for so long, it was very interesting to revisit. The parallels between us meant that I felt I had a sympathetic view of a lot of his, um, the, the issues he had, a lot of the pressure he was under, because you cannot do a job like that for that long, and we both did a sort of decade um, on, on one show that to the outside world, to the public, was a treasured, loved, long-running, you know, celebrated thing, that the press would always be happy to cover in a positive way, um, was always a good news story. But in reality, at the BBC, at the time we were both in those programmes, nobody really cared. They didn't want to know. You know, it was like, oh, not that. You know, they wanted to talk about new things. They wanted to talk about, you know, in John's case, in drama department, Doctor Who was probably the very lowest, bar possibly only triangle, in terms of the pecking order of anyone being interested. When I was working on Blue Peter, for a lot of the time, anything that was coming along that was new, people were more excited by, more into, even though they repeatedly flopped and never got the same audience figures or whatever, you know, you were never popular because you were the thing that had been there for years. You were the dinosaur. You had all the baggage of John Val and Pete, like he had all the baggage of Tom Baker and the rest of it. You know, it's very hard to keep uh, a flagship programme fresh.
and evolve it and and it's harder when you love it in some ways it's very very easy to come in and just think well I'm just doing a job here and I can do this and do this and do this whereas I think I really felt for John that a lot of the time he he was hurt so much by the criticism because his personality was so invested in the show and that is very difficult and that's your own fault to some extent you know you do have to try and keep one side of a line and I, I had a lot of feeling for that and I really I really felt the way he was managed and treated um, hadn't hugely changed in lots of ways in this kind of when something goes wrong you can't find anyone to support you when there's an award suddenly the room's full you know and that as they say is showbiz um, and he knew that and I think that the fact that he never really bitched and moaned and complained about that at all was hugely to his credit. Some people have asked me about the title JNT the life and scandalous times of John Nathan Turner and as to whether that I mean obviously you know you're looking for a title that people will look at and remember it is a very crowded marketplace but it wasn't just a sort of cynical decision and one of the things I say is that it, we're talking about scandalous times it's not the scandalous life and times of John Nathan Turner and there is a there's a subtle but important difference because John lived through the period when the program was hitting the headlines as much for the wrong reasons as the right reasons, certainly towards the latter part of things, you know, when the lead actor was let go, when, you know, the show was postponed, cancelled, depending on what you believe, and all of those sort of stories. So it seemed to me appropriate in that sense. Moving on to where that word might apply to John's own life, I mean, that was something that I had to kind of address head on. You know, if you want to do a serious biography of somebody, it's no good writing what's called a hagiography, where you're just, everything's marvellous. Well, because nobody's life is like that. God forbid that someone were to write a book about you or me. You know, one of the things that would happen is that things that perhaps you didn't want to be talked about would be in there. So then the question is, what is appropriate to talk about? What's relevant? Where does it, where's the overspill into your professional life? And with John, there was a lot of overspill of his personal life into his professional life. So in terms of doing a serious account of his life, that had to be talked about. One of the things I've said to people is that during the research and all the interviewing, I think if I'd found stuff that I thought was really dark, I would have probably just abandoned it and thought, no, this isn't for me, I'm, I'm not doing panorama. I'm trying to do a story of uh, the Doctor Who producer that I remember. Um, and I think there will be debates about, you know, to what extent John's behaviour in certain areas was acceptable or unacceptable. Uh, but I kind of felt that, you know, what I did discover, it was reasonable and relevant to discuss and debate. And in fact, particularly in the wake of things that have happened in the last few years, uh, one of the problems that we have, one of the problems that I have to deal with is, in writing something like this, is that we now live in a kind of slightly hysterical media age in that, you know, people are always looking to make a big song and dance about things. And very often the detail gets lost in that and things can be so twisted. That's always been a sort of tabloid tradition. But I think we're now in an era where there could be a big, big noise made about things and then the circus moves on to the next thing. And in that process, a lot of rationality goes out of the window. And I think this book should be judged on the, the actual text, not on a few bits that are boiled up and taken out of it out of context, because the context is really important. I, th I always think that when you start these projects, you know, if you had any concept of how much work would be involved, you'd probably kind of fight shy of it because, you know, there's no such thing as doing too much research, um, but you obviously have a limited amount of time. As it turned out, I probably worked on this book for about a year uh, in between other projects, um, and there was an enormous amount of research. I mean, leaving aside the primary sources, i.e. the interviews, I talked to 110 people some of whom I met, some of whom I spoke with on the phone, but by and large that, you know, that was an ongoing process. But as well as that, I was given access to all of John's surviving paper archive, his photo archive, some of the videos, some of the uh, material that, that he kept. He was a hoarder, thankfully, for posterity. Um, and also the legacy of his collection that was deposited at the British Film Institute. Then there was the material within the BBC's own archive. Um, and on top of that, there was a lot of incidental stuff to look at, you know, and it, you know, that does take a lot of time. And as well as kind of absorbing all of that and thinking about it, you have to kind of, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's, you know, how does it all relate to each other? Are there any insights or revelations? Are there things that you discover 
that you start to kind of go down a road. And one very good example of that was the only woman that John loved, you know, that he'd hinted at in his own memoir. And that took quite a while to kind of identify who that person was, then track her down, and then happily she was willing to talk to me. And that seemed to me to be a really key part of his story that, you know, if I had just sort of ignored that or hadn't gone down that road, you know, that would have been, you know, part of the story that had been missed out. So the research is vital, and in this case it was pretty exhaustive. I think when you start to um, investigate somebody's life and find out about them, the people that they love, the people that matter to them most, which quite often boils down to a very few people, the people who are really kind of top of the list in that person's life, are hugely significant. And there's no doubt um, in my mind that Gary Downey, John's life partner, they were together for nearly 30 years, um, has a huge part to play in John's story in, in how things worked out. And he certainly is viewed very differently by many of John's colleagues and closest friends. And, you know, you'll have to form your own view from reading it. But I think that Gary was not, did not share um, many of the qualities that people talk about uh, that John had, the positive qualities of openness, friendliness, generosity, kindness, great sense of humour. I think Gary had many of his own demons. I mean, you know, this wasn't Gary Downey's story, so necessarily some of that stuff got left out, but I think he had a very, very difficult childhood. And if you go back to that principle that most people's childhoods give you some degree of explanation as to how they then develop as adults, certainly I think Gary had a lot of baggage and, and he carried that baggage with him fairly visibly. Um, on the positive side, you can also say that there is something kind of wonderful about a love affair that lasted so long. I mean, yes, they were both promiscuous homosexual guys partying and having fun and rest of it, but they always came back to each other and it was definitely a, a, a love that was, you know, demonstrably... Uh, strong throughout that those three decades. You know, I, can, I glibly roll off this figure of I talked to 110 people, and I think what went on there was that I started off by trying to track down people who were important to John personally, and who therefore wouldn't be at all known to a Doctor Who audience, people who were his real mates, whether they were his best friend at school, or the people who were he, he was friendly with when he first joined the BBC. Uh, as well as that, I thought the key Doctor Who contributors were obviously essential, but only if they were going to kind of talk in a way that perhaps was, you know, get, went a bit deeper than, than before. Because I wanted them to talk about their memories of John as a person, as an individual. Not really, it wasn't about the stories they made or the stuff they did. It was about how they related personally to each other. And then, with a bit more perspective, I think it's very interesting that there's this whole generation of fans who've become professionals. The ultimate example is Russell T Davis, who, who talked you know, as he does tend to, quite candidly, but, you know, with enormous passion and enthusiasm. And people whose lives, like mine, I, I was a fan, I got involved in a kind of professional uh, basis uh, and then went off and had my own career in, in TV. And I think there are now an awful lot of people who kind of are in that same category. And it's very interesting because it does give you um, a richer perspective. It means that you can appreciate a nuance that people who don't give a damn about Doctor Who but happen to work on it blatantly don't. So when you talk to somebody who worked on the series perhaps in the 70s or 80s and it was just another job, that comes out of them in, you know, even if they quite liked it. And, and it's very easy for them just to talk about personalities because that was what mattered really, not the show. Whereas when you talk to people who started off as fans and then became professionals, you're getting a kind of layered response, which is really interesting and is often tempered by the fact that all the fandom, all the fanness in the world can't protect you from the reality of working in a profession. So if you are going to be the fan that gets the chance to run Doctor Who, as Russell T Davies did, the reality of that is going to come home to roost far more than kind of any of your, you know, teenage dreams about what would you do if you were given the kind of the magic key to the production office or whatever. And, and therefore, their um, perspective on the life and the achievements, and otherwise, of John Nathan Turner, the pressures that John Nathan Turner was under. I mean, there is no doubt that John was under colossal pressure and was very exposed in a way that, that perhaps isn't so, so true of modern Doctor Who because there are more people involved and it's a more kind of sophisticated process. 
And I think that that's something that comes out loud and clear in the book, this idea of this guy who was kind of left to it. And, and that was great for him in some ways, but it was also quite toxic. And I think it really did put him under very unreasonable stress. I think it's perfectly reasonable that people will have concerns about, you know, what's the veracity of this book? What's the kind of objective of it? But I think one thing that's really important to say is that when I had got to the point where the book was nearly finished and I was putting it all together, most of the people closest to John read the manuscript. I felt that was really important. It wasn't that I was necessarily going to change things if they didn't like them, but I certainly would have changed sort of factual things or rebalanced things if people felt they were really you know, off kilter and not right. And that, to me, was very important. John and Gary did not leave family to whom they were close. John was an only child, his parents predeceased him. So I found people who were close enough to him to represent his point of view. And whether they were very, very close friends from a professional background or a personal background, that meant I felt much more secure that what I was putting out there was stuff that, you know, if John had had children or siblings, they would have had that same opportunity because this is not about kind of doing a fast one and saying, how can we shock everyone? How can we, you know, put something out there that's going to really kind of put the wind up everyone? It was about trying to keep faith to the original idea, which was, can I really capture who this man was in all his complexity and let the reader make their own conclusions about, you know, the pros and cons of that and the rights and wrongs of what happened? And so I think that was a very, very important part of the process. And that's what I would say to people who, who perhaps had concerns about, you know, what was the thinking behind this book? John and Gary were hoarders, which meant that they kept huge amounts of material relating to their lives, photographs, letters, scripts, you know, all sorts of stuff. And because Doctor Who fans are hoarders too, and because they didn't have children, some of their collection went to friends of theirs who happened to be fans, and that's how it survived. Um, going through a lot of that stuff was, I mean, apart from being hugely relevant and useful, it was also quite poignant. It's always poignant to go through the things that people leave behind them and to try and guess in some cases, well, why was that special? What was going on on that day? There were scores of personal photographs going back years, although curiously not a huge number from when John was a child or, or when he was a young adult. And I suspect that that was partly because, you know, he was moving around a lot in the theatre and things and, you know, cameras were not as common in those days. But, but that photo archive, making the choices about the pictures to go in, was really tricky because there was a huge, huge selection. And I always like seeing the really kind of, when you say candid, that can be misinterpreted. What I mean is natural, you know, the kind of in-the-moment shots rather than the posed, you know, we're all familiar with the shot of John doing that and, you know, the kind of eyes and teeth thing. But I, I found it very instructive to see him, you know, kind of off duty, as it were, and it made him more human in lots of ways. So, yeah, that's what we've tried to reflect in the choice of illustrations, things that are not the usual things perhaps that you'd see. Some of those, but, but you know, a good range. Although John wrote his own memoirs, they had massive limitations because I think he was really confining himself to talking about what he was comfortable with largely. So there's not much kind of real depth there. And there's certainly not much in terms of answering the many and various criticisms that he had to face, not just during his lifetime, but obviously subsequently some of those criticisms have sort of taken root. And one of the things that I was really interested to do was to hold those up to the light and ask was that really true? Was it really true that he didn't want to leave Doctor Who and that he just wanted to stay there as long as possible? And of course, in some cases, and that's a good example, I discovered that actually the reverse was the case and he was trying to move on from Doctor Who almost from word go when he was incredibly ambitious. And, you know, some of those things where you think, well, that's always said about him, but is it really true? When you test them, sometimes you find out they are and then you've got kind of concrete evidence to support that. But in other cases, the case is flimsier and you suddenly discover that actually by not answering some of these criticisms in his lifetime, things have been allowed to kind of get cemented into myth that perhaps need to be challenged. Um, and that's very often on the basis of, of paper archives, things that survive from the time, not just on people's memories, which can obviously be somewhat less reliable or prone to, prone to a bit of opinion, you know.
nowadays, Doctor Who is this colossal brand. You know, it's kind of international. It's very important to the BBC. It's one of their most important shows, not just in terms of the audiences it brings in, um, but also in terms, obviously, the money it makes. John saw all that coming. John could have kind of, you know, been the uh, engineer of that if he'd been allowed to be. You know, we can leave aside the arguments, the artistic arguments about, you know, whether the, the content would have been, uh, you know, as strong or whatever. But he was constantly hamstrung by a series of factors, not least by the fact that the BBC didn't really care about it at the time, didn't understand it, certainly didn't want to invest in it. Um, technology wasn't really up to speed either. But crucially, John was kind of on his own. I mean, John had no kind of team around him. He had a very, very, very small team, which he always used to refer to as the front office. Um, and that was kind of people with less experience than him. You know, his secretary, his script editor, who was up to his eyes doing the stories, and the, and the money person, who was kind of cooking the books as much as possible to try and make a little go a long way. But John didn't have the benefit of a big press operation, a marketing operation. He had a load of, frankly, fairly, you know, kind of dodgy characters in what was enterprises who had that old school BBC attitude of, you know, we don't want to be too vulgar and sell this thing to, it's not very BBC. You know, whereas John was a showman. And I always think the greatest tragedy is that somebody didn't think, okay, you know, John's done Doctor Who too long, but he really loves this show, really gets it. Let's put him in charge of selling it to the world. We'll get a new team in who are actually going to make the show, he'll sell it, because he would have flown with that. And I think that was, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's obviously the benefit of hindsight, but I absolutely think if someone had that thought, he would have been, you know, away. I think it's very easy to be critical of John Nathan Turner, and plenty of people have been, uh, about the way that kind of conventions became incredibly important. And some people say, oh, he took his eye off the ball, and, you know, he was spending too much time and attention and energy on those. But again, it comes back to that thing of, well, his talent, one of his talents, was in seeing how the show could proliferate, the show could kind of get bigger and bigger by this kind of viral, before anybody used that word, um, impact of, of running conventions where people would suddenly get involved as fans in a kind of sub-community. They would meet other fans, they would have a great time, they would want to do this again, they would want to spend their money, they would want to kind of become, if you like, in the calendar of their year, maybe one, two, three... That was an amazingly canny thing to sponsor and back and very un-BBC at the time. The idea that a BBC producer would kind of, they might, as they had done before, sort of take a tolerant but distant view. Yes, you can get along with that. And frankly, there was this kind of quite deep-held contempt for a lot of fans, I think, within the BBC. This kind of idea, well, they're barkers, they're mad. And John a little bit went along with that. Probably he couldn't not, because he did meet some of the more extreme examples of, of fandom. But I think that he also was a fan himself. And I think, you know, going back to when he was a child and he used to write off to Hollywood movie companies for, for autographs and, you know, he understood that mentality and he was also all about, you know, how do you put on a show? How do you kind of... Make... So conventions were kind of something he really got and I think that um, that is part of his legacy, you know, the idea that these things have real value. I asked everybody what they thought he would think about the idea of a biography. And I also asked everybody what they would think, what they would say to John if he was suddenly in the room now in front of them, which was very, very interesting, so particularly with some of the people who are vehemently against him. Quite often they completely sort of changed and they thought, oh, if he was here now, perhaps they wouldn't go off on a rant about, perhaps they would say something else, you know. And I think that um, trying to reconnect people with the fact that John Nathan Turner wasn't a brand. He wasn't just a kind of, you know, the big name, the, the guy at the end of the credits and all of that. He was all of those things too. But first and foremost, he was either a friend, a colleague, a lover, an enemy, any of those things. And trying to get people to genuinely talk about who John was in those terms, rather than this kind of, you know, slightly removed BBC figure, was really important in, in the whole of the book. And asking them and asking people, what would John make of this book? I mean, the interesting thing was that the consensus, by and large, was that people would think that he would be thrilled, that you know, he was a showman, he loved the limelight. And I do think that he also had slightly a kind of, oh, well, fuck them. You know, if you don't like me, I'm just doing my best. And you don't really know me. I'm just out there, you know, trying to kind of dazzle with very little money. 
and, and very little at my disposal except what I can rally. And he did all of those things with knobs on. And I think he would have felt unapologetic about lots of the things that he did. Um, and I, you know, I, I kind of feel, I feel that I could have met him, handed him a copy and said, you won't like all of this, um, but I think you'll laugh at a lot of it. And I think some of it you'll think, yeah, that was me.